Well, hello, my lovelies, and welcome to Where the Road Rises, Law Lessons Legacy, with me, your host, Eileen Curlin Walsh. Today, we welcome to Channel 4 Stickney Township's venerable supervisor, Louis Viverito. Louis has an incredible 48 year history with the township. He has received accolades and awards too numerous to mention. Prior to his current role, Lewis served in the Illinois Senate for 16 years, the last five of which he was majority whip. Perhaps the jewel in the crown of his accomplishments with the Senate and Stickney Township is the magnificent Lewis S. Viverito Senior Center in Burbank. Lewis started his career of service to his country in the United States Army at 19 years of age. And we are honored to have Lewis share his stories, his wisdom, his experience, and his advice with us today. Welcome, Lewis. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You, thank you. You are welcome. And we are delighted to hear all about that life that you had lived. Why don't we just get started? with your childhood. Where and when were you born? How did you grow up? How did I grow up? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I grew up in the Bridgeport area in uh, around White Sox Ballpark in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, one of five children. Uh, my mother and father, of course, uh, were there many, many years ago. And uh, I got involved in uh, Probably the greatest thing in that old neighborhood, I'd have to say, was the old Valentine's Boys Club. Mm. Because after school, I had a place to go, a place to play, a place to grow, and was able to be off the street and learning things about life. Ah. But it was the Chicago Boys Club, I think, Valentine's Boys Club, that kind of steered me in the right direction. Ah, that's interesting. Yes, yes. And how were your parents? Were your parents in public service? No, my father was no. He was just a truck driver. He never believed that my mother should ever work. He was an old-fashioned Italian. Yes, yes. And he did not believe in any women working. I know that surprises you, Eileen, yeah. for me to say that, but at that time, that's the way it was. It was. She was a baker, a cooker, a sewer, and she was home all the time when we came home. And that's the way it was. They didn't have much, but it was enough to pay the rent. Yeah. And we ended up buying our own home there after a certain amount of years. Yeah. Uh, but that's the way it was. Yes. And yes. at that time, most people were about the same. Women mm -hmm. weren't as achievers as you are now. Uh, they weren't as professional as they are now, thank God. Thank God that women are more independent and not so dependent on men alone. Yeah. And at that time, uh, women were forced to do mm -hmm. things that they really didn't want to do. So I'm grateful that yeah. the women's movement moved forward and a woman doesn't have to take any guff anymore. Well, thank you, absolutely. We have come a long way. <laughs> yes. But it also, that traditional background, your father working really hard, mom at home, raising you children, as well as the Boys Club was a nice, solid yes. foundation Yes, well, that's the way you. it was. That's mm -hmm. the way it was. You were just lucky to have a good hot meal at night and. Mm -hmm chat with the family and mm -hmm. everybody knew what everybody was doing and everybody knew everyone on the block. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew who was good and who wasn't so good. And we'd sit out on the porch and listen to the White Sox games after I was parking the cars over there to make a few bucks. Uh, that's the way it was in Bridgeport. We all grew up as a family and uh, things said about Bridgeport, the greatest thing we had going in Bridgeport was uh, we had Mayor Daly who lived right but a few blocks away on 35th and Low Avenue, and we're also very proud of him. So mm -hmm. that was Bridgeport had a solid base and a lot of hardworking people. Yeah. And that's where I came from. But mm -hmm. I give a lot of credit to my uh, growth and development to Valentine's Boys Club. I love that. And at 19 years of age, you were drafted into the United States Army. I got drafted uh, when I was just 19 years mm -hmm. old. And I remember that vividly because I was just getting ready uh, to get married uh, 11 days before the wedding. Uh, my father died and I got a deferment for four months. Mm -hmm. And then my mother said, Lou, I've decided and it's very difficult for me, but I think you're the oldest of the five. I've just turned 20 then. So it's actually 20. And I 
she said, well, I said, what do you want me to do? She says, I think you should go because your brother Bert will have to go. And he was working for Kilbar Electric at that time on the poles. Mm -hmm. And he was learning to be an apprentice electrician. <laughs> and I remember vividly, I said, Ma, whatever you think I should do, I'll do. And I did. And the next thing I knew, I was on a ship going to Japan and landed in Incheon, Korea, and went up almost to the 38th parallel in a combat zone. And uh, I think I was there 10 months when the war ended. Or the police action, it wasn't called a war. Mm. It was called a police action. Yeah. Back when I came out, I tried to join the VFW and I wasn't allowed to because that was not a war. That was a police action, uh -huh. even though we lost almost 50,000 troops. Yeah. But yeah. that's the way it was. Mm -hmm. And you accepted the way it was. I accept everything the way it was. Mm -hmm. I never thought of not, <laughs> mm -hmm. not accepting what my responsibilities. Yeah. yeah. And then your path led you eventually to the Illinois Senate. Tell well, I got to the Illinois Senate journey. because, frankly, politics was not my forte. I really never had any great desires to be in politics. But what happened was that I had became a, believe it or not, I became a local barber. Mm -hmm. I went to Tilden Tech High School, which was a technical school, and I went to Chicago Barber College. Mm -hmm. And I met so many people in the barber shop that I was cutting the hair of the Democratic committeeman and supervisor <laughs> and the owner of the barn restaurant. Remember the old barn I, I mean, do. That used to be in, mm -hmm. in, in, in State unincorporated Road. Stickney? Mm -hmm. And yes. he's the one that talked me into becoming a trustee in the township of Stickney. And I said, I, I'm not an auditor. I don't know anything about audit. You don't know it's a trustee. You just oversee things. I said, well, why would you want a guy like me? I, I'm not involved in politics, doctor. He was a doctor. He was a PhD, graduated from Revis High School, and he was a Northwestern University graduate. Mm -hmm. And I liked him a lot. I knew his father, and knew them all. And he said, uh, Lou, you make a good uh, politician. I said, uh, uh, Bob, I said, I'm really not in politics. He said, but I think you, why don't you consider it? Mm -hmm. So I got the job and I think I was getting $15 a month and I learned a lot mm -hmm. about government and politics. But that's how my career began mm -hmm. because I knew and I was flattered that he asked me because I was not a Northwestern guy or Loyola or DePaul. I said, you know, I only went to Barber College. He said, that doesn't matter. You, you, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started. And then you were a trustee in the township trustee. as well as being an Illinois State Senator. I became an Illinois State Senator in 1994. Mm -hmm. I became the assistant majority leader about 10 or 12 years later because, believe it or not, at that time uh, the president of the Senate was uh, Pate Phillips and he was the powerhouse Republican. And, they pretty well ran the Senate. But then when things changed, uh, Emil Jones became the president of the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say anything at that time, but he said it to me, now Lou, don't be telling everybody that you and I went to Tilden Tech together. <laughs> I says, why not, Emil? He said, because you know, I'm gonna make you the assistant majority leader. And you know, you, 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 you know I, I said, assistant majority leader? He said, yes, you're, you, got, you can do it, you can do it. Well, I had a good speaking voice, mm -hmm. that's what he told me. Because if I get on the podium, they could hear me at the other side because mm -hmm. I had a strong voice. Mm -hmm. So that's how I became the assistant majority leader. But it was a long road up and yeah. George Dunn was a big help to me, the president of the county board. And the uh, inspirational guy to me really was Richard J. Daly, ah. who gave me my first beginning back in 1970 when I became Democratic Committeeman. He backed me. Ah, I and see. I ran on St. Patrick's Day and I won with the help of so many others. And that's how my politics began. Right. But it was an accident. I, yeah. I, I don't know how it happened, but Isn't it happened. That just a series of, of happy accidents exactly. as right you place, go through right life. Time. Right place, right, right time. Right time. And, and you know, it was, it was something that overwhelmed me. Mm -hmm. I often look back and uh, with a great deal of pride that I was able to accomplish so much with yes. so many different 
people helping me. I didn't do it alone. And let's look at that. So as senator and when you were a majority whip, you never took your eyes off your district. Let's talk about some of the things you were able to achieve for the 11th district. Well, the important part about the advantage that I had becoming a state senator was to be in a rural area like Stickney was because Stickney was really uh, uh, the poorest area, I think, almost in and around the southwest side. You know, in your area of Oaklawn, they were like elitist to us. We didn't even have our own post office. Yeah. We had 60638, and everybody thought it was Chicago. <laughs> and it was Stickney. But mm -hmm. Mayor Daly said, where's Stickney at? I said, oh, it's right next to Oaklawn, Your Honor. Next to oh, Oaklawn, but he didn't know where Stickney was. Right. It was a hidden jewel. But the jewel part was when I came out of Korea, I could put $500 down on a house, which I did, and I got a 4.5% loan, GI loan. Ah. That's how we got our first house. And why did I move to Stickney? It was the poorest area you could go to. The sewers were backing. There was no sewers. There were septic systems. Mm -hmm. There were wells. There were no streets. Mm -hmm. But there had houses going in. And you could, a lot of GIs were going out there, guys like myself. Mm -hmm. right out of Korea or wherever they were. Mm -hmm. You could get a small loan and get a little house. Mm -hmm. What's more in life than having your own home? Absolutely. It was a modest home, yeah. but I was on a 60-foot lot. I felt good about it. Yeah. And then I worked for the barbershop at uh, 7909 Narragansett, but I also worked at Ford Aircraft Engine Division. I paid $9 a day and I took care of all the executives at Ford Aircraft Engine Division. Mm -hmm. So that's how my career began. Right. But it started out with no intentions of being a politician. Mm -hmm. In fact, as the years went on, Eileen, I found out politics is a tough, hard road. I would imagine <laughs> a tough, hard road. <laughs> and you have all those years and you withstood it. And here you are still as the supervisor of the Stickney Township, that township that you bought your first home in just fresh out of Korea and freshly married. So let's talk about Stickney Township and what it, what it is and what it does. Maybe talk a little bit about the services that it provides to well, those think, who I think, qualify. I think what saved Stickney Township was the township having a medical center. And at that time, there was a great deal of uh, sanitary district problems there was, as I told you, a lot of the septic systems and things mm -hmm. like that. And they had formed a public health district, I believe it was back in about 1950 or 48. The township supervisor knew that he had health issues. And he was a pretty sharp man at that time. I think his name was Maid. I did meet him one time. And the Clearing Industrial District, which was the biggest tax base in town, approved the referendum because they were, you know, were. Cracker Jack was and Tootsie Roll, they were getting employees that were living in Stickney Township. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to keep them healthy because they were trying to get employees. So they approved the public health district. So tell us what that public health district was, because that's really important to understanding the success of Stickney. So did that exist before when you first became involved with Stickney? The public they had, health they district? They had a small little clinic that was one at 5635 State Road, a very small, tiny building where they were doing a little bit of uh, physicals, immunization shots, things like that that were essential mm -hmm. to the well-being. But it was tiny and it was uh, uh, very old. Mm -hmm. And when the rain came real bad, the floors would flood. Okay. So, but that had the nucleus when I came, it was there. Mm -hmm. But when I did become the state senator, I was beginning to understand grants. I was beginning to know how to bring money into the area. And God knows we had a purpose. Yeah. We had the poorest little clinic in town, but no money. Our, all our anticipation warrants were sold. Mm -hmm. We were totally broke. Yeah. We were on our backs. And believe it or not, revenue sharing came in. That was an incentive from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And I worked with some of the federal people then at that time. I think it was Congressman Ed Lipinski. Mm -hmm. And I think the first 
grant that I received was for eight million dollars. And believe it or not, we built the administration building mm -hmm. on State Road. Yes. And that was the beginning of the growth in the development of Stickney Township. Yeah. And today we have three medical centers, a senior citizen center, one, two, three dentists, four general practitioners, four or five psychologists in our mental health, and we got three different buildings in three different locations. Everything is paid for. We don't owe a nickel. Our, our uh, Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund is funded 100%. So that is an incredible achievement. Well, thank you. Thank Absolutely you. Thank incredible. You. And the senior center, I don't mind telling you, we all have senior center envy. Oh, really? So tell That's us. That's quite a compliment on you. I feel so proud. You well, know what absolutely. we did here, Eileen? We, I, it was a broken down school mm -hmm. that was abandoned. And the city of Burbank came to me and said, Lou, you know, this building is going to cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars to, you're going to have to, we've got oil tanks in the ground, you've got environmental. I said, well, if I was able to take that from you, uh, how much can we, how much would you, he said, oh, if you're going to clean it up, it's going to probably cost you about four or five hundred thousand dollars to do the cleanup work, and you're going to have to remove all the asbestos and all the oil tanks and everything else. I said, well, is it okay if I try to do it? So I did, I went out and I talked with, I think it was at that time, Governor Ryan. And he initiated a program called uh, Illinois First. And I went to speak to the governor, I made an appointment with him. I told him what our dilemma was, that we have no senior citizen center, we have no place for our elderly to meet. And I told him about my idea to buy the school. And I said, he's gonna give it to us, the governor, for a dollar. He says, how much do you think you'll need? I said. Well, I'd have to get an estimate from the architects and, and builders. And I ended up going back to him. I said, I think we'll need about a million five hundred thousand. He said, you got it. And we got one million five hundred thousand dollars from the state, Illinois first. And that's how we built our senior citizen mm -hmm. center. All on one level. Mm -hmm. The place was falling apart. The roofs were leaking. The electric was blowing out. And we did it all, Eileen. And today, it's a model. It's a model. You Absolutely. were there, Eileen. Were you there, Eileen? As an estate planning attorney, seniors are my favorite people. <laughs> so I have sponsored many events there, spoken there often, been amazed at the attendance there. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And Thank as you. I say, the surrounding suburbs would all love to know how we could do that. We might not just have a Louis Viverito, but, but maybe we can talk about some ideas for um, the surrounding they suburbs. There should be, Eileen, every every community. I don't care if you go to the north side or the south side, after a certain amount of days, they say the school is obsolete and they knock it down. Mm -hmm. Those things could be utilized like we did. Mm -hmm. If you want to come over, you, like I said, and I don't mean to be bragging, but if you want, everything is on one level. Mm -hmm. We got all the care workers and services, congregate meals, bingo, uh, we do it all. Mm -hmm. And every day, if you go there, last year, between our area, the village of Stickney, to Burbank, two unincorporated areas, Nottingham and Central Stickney, we s spent and got from the area agency over $700,000 of money to feed our senior citizens, those that can't go out of the house, mm -hmm. those that are incapacitated, and we're having them home delivered. Uh -huh. We did over 30,000. Right. And tell me what your secret sauce is at Stickney Township. How can other townships emulate your success? Would you encourage the separate public health district? I would say the wisest thing that can be done, especially for township people that want to do a better job, they should incorporate and get a public health district mm -hmm. by referendum, which they could do. Mm -hmm. The very first bill that I passed in the Senate in 1994, I think it was, 
was to allow townships to join together to form a public health district. Because believe me, with children's teeth, podiatry, dental services for 55 and over, we don't do any cosmetic, but drilling, filling, and cleaning. Mm -hmm. The senior citizens, a lot of them wouldn't even go to a dentist if it wasn't it wouldn't cost them anything by us. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't Worth Township, Oak Lawn, want to formulate a public health district when you've got areas of poverty like within Robbins and mm -hmm. poor areas? What you do is you get to tell those people that you're going to formulate a health district. You're going to tell them that you'll be able to bring your children for immunization. Mm -hmm. You can tell them that your children is going to have their teeth fixed. You can tell them that podiatry is going to take care of mama who's diabetic and she can't go all the way down to cut her nails. Yeah. Tell them that, and I'll bet they'll vote for it. And even if some of the aristocrats didn't, those poorer areas would say yes. yes. And once you formulate a public health district, you learn to get grants and stuff. Yeah. We've had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in grants coming to us for as long as I've been involved, which is almost 50 years. Yes. And without those grants, we could never, ever be yeah. able to do what we're doing. And so that leads right to my next question was how you would answer the criticism of township government as being a non-necessary layer. So when you talk about those public health districts and providing services to many areas that really don't have the access, the stronger the public health component is, the better argument we can make for keeping our townships. Well, that's the whole point, Eileen, mm -hmm. and I'm glad that you bring it over. So what you have to do the way that I'm thinking now, I, I only have one thing going for me is mm -hmm. common sense. I would take the people that you're suggesting to formulate a public health district, I'd tell them exactly what they thought it would cost and how they could obtain grants and get monies to come into their community, and I'd take a model like Stickney Township. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, we're gonna go over to Stickney Township, we're gonna visit all of its medical we're going to meet the doctors. We're going to meet the psychiatrists. We're going to meet. We do mental health as well. Mm -hmm. You know, my kids have mental health you, problems. Oh, greatly needed, and and not talked about as much as it should be. Tremendous need in the community. Well, Eileen, you know, I have experienced that in my own family. Mm -hmm. I've had a tragedy within my own daughter, whose grandson was uh, uh, bipolar and uh, schizophrenic that did very much harm mm -hmm. and my daughter's today is buried in a cemetery uh. so i know the harsh results of mental health mm -hmm. and believe me we don't even do enough mm -hmm. i'm a big advocate yeah. of providing more mental health we yeah. also in our medical center so you know eileen we also house the the arrow school the special needs children yes. they're in our building as well probably 20 of them learning to work at McDonald's or work at Burger King. We do all of that. So if you were to try to talk people, like I talked to that Murphy girl that's in Oak Lawn, it's the new supervisor. Yes. Mm -hmm. She brought her whole board out to Stickney Township and she told me, Lou, I'm going to try to do what you've done. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, that little Murphy, I don't know her very well, but I tell you, she and her board was all impressed what they saw in Stickney Township. Mm -hmm. You could use us, and we're in the black today, but you gotta have smart people working with you. You cannot be a genius yourself. I'm not. So I had to put a lot of professional staff around me. I'm not a genius, but what we have done is rather special, and I believe that Stickney Township could formulate anybody, especially in these areas where you have poverty, where you need that kind of stuff and even the average individual that doesn't have hospitalization, doesn't have benefits, is a place for him or her to come and get some help. I love it, that's wonderful. And I was gonna ask you about your most difficult life experience, and you mentioned your daughter, and I'm sure that was hard to stand up in your shoes afterwards. It was probably the most horrible mm -hmm. situation that my wife and I ever endured. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She uh, lost her life and he didn't know what he was doing mm -hmm. and today he's in Elgin State Hospital. Yeah. So how did you get through it? Where did you get the fortitude? What quality helped you through? I think my mother and my father. Their faith. They're very dedicated to mm -hmm. family. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I think uh, seeing where they had so little, I wanted to do more for people. Yeah. And I had that strength to look at how little we had. And I thought, I wanted to be more secure than that. Yeah. And the opportunity came when I saw all these medical services that has a potential. Mm -hmm. My imagination just grew with the experiences that I had. Yeah. But my greatest thing I told you was my mother, my father, and Sh Illinois Chicago Boys Club was mm -hmm. my savior. Because every summer I would go to camp because my father said, I want Lou to be able to, we don't have any money to send him to camp, but he's willing to work. Mm -hmm. So 12 or 13 years old, I went to summer camp washing dishes, mm -hmm. setting up the breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Then I could go out and play. And I stayed there for three or four summers, and then I became a big shot. I became a lifeguard. I think I got $100 <laughs> a month. Mm -hmm. So, But that boys club saved my life. Mm -hmm. And of course, my mother and father, I'll tell you, my mother was always home, so every time I'd do something wrong, she'd say, Lou, I heard about that. So she was there to take care yeah, of me. Yeah. So it sounds <laughs> like good, honest, hard work, hard that work, work ethic was work. really a value that guided your life. Well, it's something, it's, I mm -hmm. think it's God's gift. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned imagination. The what? The value of imagination. Oh my Having God, yeah, you got a vision. vision. Yes. I mean, I'm so glad you said that. If you have no vision and you have no purpose, being able to be a servant to the public is a gift from God mm -hmm. if you do it right. But today, everybody looks at people like me as being a politician. I know I'm a politician, but I don't feel like a politician. I feel like I'm a servant of the people. I don't feel like a politician. Yeah. And I've been doing it for so many years. Why would I do it if I didn't love it? Mm -hmm. I don't need to work anymore. Mm -hmm. Name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I don't need to work anymore. Mm -hmm. And I just ran through an election. And the guy ran against me. And he said, Viverito, you're 89 years old. Let's get rid of this old man. Well, all of a sudden, Eileen, I get inspiration. My inspiration was telling the public, when I was 19, nobody said I was too young when I went to Korea. No, when they put me in a combat zone, nobody said, Lou, you're too young. So now you're telling me I'm too old. My mind is, I can remember the day, I remember the day that I graduated from McClellan Grammar School. I remember the day my mother said, Lou, I'm gonna get you a nice warm coat. I said, Ma, I just want a little, they're just wearing a little gabardine coat, Ma. Well, she went to the Goodwill and got a coat. It was all the way down to my ankle, but it was very warm. I cried all the way going to school because I didn't want to wear the overcoat. Yeah. <laughs> but she thought she was giving me something big. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's like Dolly Parton's <laughs> coat of many colors. I love it. And that, that story is, is just brilliant, Lou. I, I you, almost Anna. want to end our interview right there because they say at 89, the incredible age of 89, no, you're I'm still not, I'm, 90, I'm 90 now. You are 90? I'm 90 years old. In fact, now Eileen, are you listening? Are you listening? We are all listening. All right. Believe it or not, I went to the church and I met my pastor. I said, Father, if November 25th, which is Thanksgiving Day, my wife and I are celebrating our 70th anniversary. 70 years I've been married to the same woman. Amazing. And she was a German Lutheran. Her father was not crazy about me, but he learned to like me. <laughs> and we got married 70 years ago. And we're going to have a nice little thing after Mass, 730, 1030, 12 o'clock. And all the people are coming down to have coffee and cake. And our pastor's trying to get a new canopy. And I said, any donation that would come in will go to the for your new canopy, Father. That's amazing. So now that I know you're 90, <laughs> I have to ask one last question. Yes. 90 years, life well lived. What is the one quality you would want to be remembered for? A servant of the people. Mm. A servant of the people. Not a politician. Lewis. A servant to the people. And you have certainly shown that over and over and Thank over. You, Thank you, Alan. And you have just been a delight to us. You. I want you. you to come back for chapter two. <laughs> we just 
We well, barely I told you, I told you from my heart, I, mean, I told you from my heart. But being a servant at my time of life is a gift. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you are a gift to us. So thank you so much, Lewis, you, for Eileen. sharing with us. Thank you. It's been wonderful listening to you. I feel inspired by you and I know our viewers <laughs> have too. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you. There are so many services way beyond what we talked about available through the township. So would the best thing, Lewis, be for our viewers to just call the township office? Yes. Call the Township Office, and I believe I have that number right here, 708-599-3115. If you need some information, and as you know, viewers, you can always call me at Curlin Walsh Law, 708-448-5169, and I can share the information about our guests with you so thanks once again for listening thanks for always being with us thank us for you for your questions your suggestions and i will see you next time on where the road rises thanks and bye